All right. Um, so our second presentation today is from Melina Lower. Uh, she is a PhD candidate in a Andrew Wargo's lab at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Her dissertation examines the post-host jump evolution of the fish virus IHNV, focusing on the viral traits of virulence, shedding, and transmission. Prior to graduate school, she worked at the UC Davis Bodega Marine Lab and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, researching molluscan pathogens and hopes to pursue a postgraduate career in disease ecology, aquaculture, and or science policy. So go ahead and take it away, Melina. Great, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, thanks everyone for being here today. I have two quick little notes before I get into my talk. Um, so on the right upper hand corner, I put a very pale blue rectangle. If you like to have a little Zoom screen going during seminar, that's where you can put it. I've tried to structure my slides around it. Also, um, this is preliminary data, it's unpublished, and I really welcome your comments after the talk. Um, so I'll just get started. Hi, my name's Melina. Um, so I, I know from looking at the Zoom attendees that there are a lot of people here that know way more than I do about IHNV, for, but if you know less than I do, I have a, a pretty broad introduction to get everybody on the same page. So uh, I study a disease called infectious hematopoietic necrosis virus, or IHNV. Um, it targets the liver and kidneys, and it can affect all members of the fish family Salmonidae. Uh, it can be lethal, particularly to juvenile fish, and it can be really devastating for farms. So it's it's not just a conservation issue for um, endangered Salmonids, but it's also a really big commercial issue for um, farming operations. And partly due to trout farming spread across the Northern Hemisphere, IHNV has become globally distributed in rainbow trout, and it's also OIE reportable. Uh, there are a few images of clinical signs of IHNV on here that I borrowed from a paper, and it can be pretty nasty in fish. So we know a little bit about IHNV's um, origins. We understand that IHNV co-evolved with sockeye salmon Oncorhynchus nerca in the Pacific Northwest region of North America, uh, indicated by this um, very rough, I, I think you guys can see my mouse, um, this rough um, purple oval in the map. And uh, with the rise of aquaculture, rather commercial aquaculture in North America, IHNV was able to go through a host jump from sockeye salmon, its endemic host, into rainbow trout. And once it was in rainbow trout farms, IHNV proliferated rapidly, both uh, geographically as well as uh, genetically, uh, uh, in genetic diversity to its current spread. Uh, so it hooked from sockeye to trout, and now it is a global spread and has a major disease threat to aquaculture production everywhere. So fortunately, we know a lot about IHNV since its host jump. Um, uh, this is data from one of Rachel Breta's paper. She, uh, she and her team um, put a lot of work into developing a phylogenetic tree for IHNV. And I'm not going to go into all of the details of it, partly because I, I don't know it as well as um, as well as she does. But uh, very broadly, I'll point out that there are two big branches relevant to my talk today. Um, the bottom branch is bracketed in blue on the bottom half of this screen, and this uh, section of viruses constitutes what we call the U geno group in IHNV, or it's it's the ancestral branch of the tree that's most closely associated with sockeye salmon. And the top half of this tree bracketed in yellow is termed the M geno group, which has emerged in rainbow trout and has primarily originated since its host jump in aquaculture. Something that this tree doesn't really indicate very well is that the genetic diversity of the M geno group is roughly four times that of the U geno group. So that's really interesting to us and we wanna know more about how it continues to evolve, particularly in aquaculture settings. So the focus of my dissertation, which I won't cover in our 20 minutes today, but the focus of my dissertation really looks at how IHNV phenotypes have changed and evolved since its, since its host jump as a whole. Um, so one part of IHNV's phenotype that we have some data for, um, just a, a quick aside, a viral phenotype in this case might mean um, its level of virulence, um, how it sheds or transmits to other hosts, the timing of those, um, those different traits. 
So one trait that I've spent a lot of time looking at is virulence. And in the first chapter of my dissertation, I investigated virulence across five decades of evolution and two uh, broad genome groups using a selection of 15 archived viral isolates. Um, I was very fortunate to have a lot of help with this work. Some of my collaborators are on this call now. Um, so this is uh, unpublished data. I'm just going to focus on two, uh, two isolates in particular from these studies uh, in the little rectangles. So um, when I looked at virulence across all these different isolates, we selected a 1974 isolate, HAVT74, and a 2017 isolate, HT13417. And from the plot on the right, you can see that the virulence um, in terms of cumulative percent mortality on the y-axis uh, was quite different between the two of them. For the 1974 isolate in blue, it was a little under 50%, which is still quite damaging if you're a fish farmer. Um, and the 2017 isolate was absolutely obliterating to the fish in our experiment. We had triplicate grant tanks of 20 fish to represent different populations, and it killed over 95% in each tank. Um, so that's great data for us to have. We've seen a change in virulence. That's interesting. Um, and we also spent some time looking at a different phenotypic trait or a set of traits, uh, which is shedding in the same isolates. We did paired shedding studies, and we saw that um, while the virulence was quite different, the shedding uh, metrics were actually quite similar. So this plot on the right, which came from a, a, a more complicated experiment whose design I'm not going to go into. Um, we looked at the, how fish were shedding over time. The x-axis indicates the number of days since infection for our host fish, and the y-axis is the number of fish in those treatments that were shedding. So same colors, same viruses here. The um, 1974 isolate is in blue, and the 2017 isolate is in orange. We see that same number of fish are generally shedding through time. There's a little bit of difference around days five to seven, but for the most part, they have um, the same same shedding kinetics, that is the pattern through time, and also the same uh, peak. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Sorry about that. Um, we also looked at the amount of virus that was being shed by the number of these fish. So this is the cumulative this little tiny plot on the top is the cumulative amount of virus shed per fish. And we also saw that that um, magnitude of shed virus in the water was pretty similar between um, the viruses. So that was really interesting because we saw this really big difference in virulence, but not a huge difference in shedding. And we wondered what could explain this discrepancy. Um, perhaps um, it could be explained by transmission, another, another aspect of a virus's phenotype instead of shedding. So that gets me to my research questions for the um, more detailed study that I wanted to present to you guys today. The first of my research questions is, is shed rate or um, the amount of virus, the virus released into the water by a host, an accurate proxy for transmission potential. A lot of times it's really difficult or impossible to measure transmission. So we measure shed virus in water, but we're making a lot of assumptions about whether or not that virus is actually viable to infect and transmit between hosts. So I'm really interested in that. The second question is, how does that viral fitness at the individual shedding level translate to fitness at a population level? Okay, I think this is the only slide where my little rectangle situation didn't work out. Um, and I know there's a lot of information, but I'll walk you through the methods. Uh, we're gonna go top to bottom, left to right, I exposed donor fish to one of three different treatments for our transmission experiment. It was either a mock, which was our negative control, or one of the two isolates, again, 1974 or 2017. I used a slightly different color, but they're the same viruses. Um, for each of the viral isolate exposures, I had 50 replicate fish exposed in the same tank to virus at a dose that we know infects um, pretty much 100% of our donor fish. Um, step two separated all of those donor fish into individual tanks, one fish per tank. And just a quick note, all of our donor fish had clipped fins. They'd been clipped several weeks before the experiment because we wanted to be able to commingle fish, but still be able to tell who we had intentionally infected. And then after they were in their individual tanks, um, we went through a series of cohabitation periods where each cohabitation period or cohab, I would add a single recipient naive fish into the tank. That fish had its full fin so we could tell them apart. And the assumption here was that the donor fish would be infected, they would begin to replicate virus, 
shed that virus into the water, and then that shed virus would be um, uh, able to possibly infect the naive recipient fish and um, create a transmission event. So um, the fish were allowed to co-mingle for 48 hours, uh, two days, and I would take a water sample at the end of that cohabitation period to determine how much virus was shed in the in the that 48 time 48 hour time period by the donor fish, um, which is also the exposure dose for the recipient fish. After the end of that cohabitation period, we'd separate the two fish again. The donor fish would stay in that same tank and get a water flush and get a little cleaned out, get some food. Um, the recipient fish would go to a separate tank where it would get a water flush and then we would monitor it for uh, three days when we expected the peak of shedding to occur um, and take a subsequent water sample from that tank to see if that recipient fish began to shed. Uh, we assumed that any fish that a recipient fish was shedding was the result of um, a transmission event that it had been affected and was shedding itself rather than any virus that was stuck. Um, finally, oh, so wait, we, for that recip uh, the recipient fish would be sampled, the donor fish would go through subsequent cohabitation periods. So those started on day zero, day two, and day four post initial virus exposure. Finally, I had a whole bunch of water samples and I um, have been analyzing them with digital PCR, which is um, super uh, sensitive and specific. So here's a little image on the left of what that actually looked like in a tank. In the foreground, you can see a fish with its full adipose fin in the yellow circle. The one in the back, it's a little hard to see, but it, the fin isn't there. Maybe, maybe you could just trust me on that. Um, generally, what we expected to see for this experiment was that um, based on our, our previous shedding kinetic studies, we knew that peak shedding would likely occur on day two. So we expected the highest rate of transmission to coincide with that, and we would see the highest um, rate of transmission events among our 50 replicate pairs per treatment. Um, we expected that highest rate to occur in the first cohabitation period, day zero to two, and then drop off a little bit in the second period and have the lowest transmission rate in um, the last one. So we're measuring not only how much virus is being shed by the donors to get an idea of the recipient dose, but also um, our, our metric here is really the percentage of donors that successfully transmit at each time period. Okay, so finally we get into some data. This is data from the uh, first cohabitation period. So I have the percentage of recipients that were affected uh, infected on the y-axis, and then each color goes, each color of the bar goes with the viral isolate, and respectively 44% of the 1974 um, donors were, or sorry, 44% of the 1974 isolate donors infected the recipients, only 26% uh, of the 2017 isolate pairs became infected. So this was really excited for exciting for me to see because this is a new method for our lab and I wasn't totally sure if we would get very much uh, measurable transmission success. So it was really nice to see that this method was working. Um, and then for the second time period, um, as predicted, we see we saw a little bit less transmission, but we still saw the general um, trend that the 1974 isolate transmitted a little bit more than the 2017 isolate. So this was really cool to see. Um, maybe my hypothesis was correct that we're um, seeing um, seeing transmission sort of match up with shedding, but this wasn't the trend that I was expecting um, considering how the isolates compared to each other. Uh, given that the higher virulence that we saw in our initial virulence studies was observed in 2017. I, I really thought that virulence shedding and transmission would kind of correlate a little bit more closely, but we had sort of some flip-flopping here. So spent some time thinking about that and analyzed uh, the quantity of virus shedding from our donors. So this first graph is the same plot that you saw on the earlier slide um, showing the percentage of transmission success per isolate. The second plot here shows the amount of virus actually being shed by those transmitting donors, or in other words, the um, exposure dose of the recipient fish in our cohabitation periods. Uh, this, this data is just from the first time period here because that's what I had time to analyze. Um, and so we see that the um, 1974 isolate sheds more and it transmits more 
but we know that it didn't actually kill as many fish in our earlier studies. Um, so this was kind of interesting and um, I spent some time thinking about this and thought that maybe I'd mixed up my data or maybe I had entered it in R wrong or something, but it wasn't any of those things. And so um, on the advice of my advisor, Andrew, I smooshed these plots together. I divided the number of transmission events by the shed quantity of virus to get a what we called an infectivity metric. And we saw that the 2017 virus, the more virulent one, also seems to be more infectious, at least by our metrics that we can get from this experiment. So that was really interesting to see and might point to um, different trans or might point to some mismatch of how we assume transmission and shedding actually go together for this virus. So I'm really excited to continue working on this data set and see what else we can learn from it. So um, as you can see, I still have some data analysis to do and continuing questions include whether that last time point follows the same trend of getting lower. Um, I still need to look at the actual quantities of virus being shed at that second time point and seeing see if it's uh, consistent through time or if the quality of um, virion particle might be changing through time. That would be really interesting and really potentially problematic for our epidemiological models. Um, and finally, I'm also interested in what that shedding threshold might be for horizontal transmission or, or, or infectious dose for different isolates and if that might change through time. And actually one of our, our colleagues, a lab technician is doing a set of studies to carry that out. Um, so this work uh, is the work of many people. Um, my lab team, our lab colleagues, um, our colleagues in Seattle, my committee members, and also our funding sources and fish sources, and most importantly, the 105 fish that gave their lives to this experiment. So um, I think we have some time for questions. And if you have more questions after today's seminar, or you want to connect with me, I really welcome any connections and being able to talk more about this because I, I love talking about disease transmission in aquatic environments. So that's it. Thanks, Melina. Um, yeah, that was a great talk. Very interesting. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat um, or just raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, we, we do have time for questions. Uh, Jim Witten has his hand raised. Hi, Melina. That was really an elegant experiment, uh, a, a huge amount of work, but uh, very convincingly showed that uh, transmission and uh, and virulence may not be uh, linked in the way that you thought. Um, but transmission is not, of course, the only virulence factor, and there's several more that you might have uh, to study before you can sort this out, uh, including uh, various uh, genomic differences in the isolates that uh, have virulence factors at the at the viral level. So. Uh, I thought that was really quite, uh, quite an elegant experiment. And uh, what was the temperature that you ran that at? Was that 15? It was 15 degrees. Yeah. That's... Yeah, that was consistent with um, our other rainbow trout studies and also what we think most aquaculture um, occurs at. Right, that's certainly true in, in Idaho aquaculture. And uh, the, it looks like the host jump was also associated with the transmission, uh, I mean, a temperature difference uh, as well. The uh, the older U isolates would tend to be more a period at 10 degrees, I think, and the, the newer ones in rainbow trout more at 15. So yes. in addition to the host, you've got a temperature factor as well. But if you ran it at 15, you were probably running at, at the correct temperature for this for these isolates. Yeah, I um I appreciate you bringing up the temperature difference. And um I I'm banging my head against the wall trying to get the manuscript out the door, but that virulence experiment that I did that I pulled some of these data from also had a temperature treatment. And um, so we did compare all the same isolates at 10 and 15 degrees in rainbow trout and compared them to ancestral um, strains in sockeye salmon at 10 degrees. So we, we saw quite a difference in spread. Um, there wasn't a huge difference in virulence um, comparisons between the two temperatures in rainbow trout, with the exception of some really old M isolates. So um, I'd be happy to share about that on another day, but I don't have the data in front of me. Okay, excellent. That's a great experiment. Yeah. Even more work. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it takes the whole team. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we still have a couple minutes. And if anybody else has another question.
Um, if nobody else has a question, I have a question for the audience. Um, have has anyone here done transmission studies in your own study systems? You you can shout it out or just throw it into the chat, but I would be really curious to to just learn more about your work or um, if you have a publication that you can point me to, I'm really interested in learning more transmission progress. Melina, do you want to drop your email in the chat real quick? Oh, yeah. Just in case anybody has more info they want to send you. That's a great idea. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions right now, so we'll go ahead and call it there. Um, good job to both of our, our speakers today. Um, great presentations, both of you. Um, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Um, next week, we will not be having um, the seminar because the fish health section